the chorus, Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name. Let's sing that together. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will But there's something about that name. How many of you love the name of Jesus? Amen. Take your Bible and go to Acts chapter 12 this morning. Acts chapter 12. So you're saying, I thought we were doing a series in Mark. We are. So hold your place in Acts chapter 12 and then go to Mark chapter 1. But we are going to be... Uh, in Acts chapter 12 in just a little bit, and I want you to have a place marked there. We are beginning a new and exciting study today through the gospel of Mark. It will take us a good while to get through this gospel. And I think all of us who love Jesus Christ want to know him in a a deeper way. We are going to enjoy our time studying this book We can't help but be changed when we study the life of Jesus Christ. It can't help but affect us. And we have entitled this series, Following Jesus, because that is always the goal as we study Jesus. It is not just to know more about Him. It is to know more about Him so that we can know Him in a deeper way. Peter says this in 1 Peter 2 and verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. Notice this statement, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. And that's why we study the gospel accounts of Christ, is to fall more deeply in love with Jesus, to know the pattern that he has set for us so that we can be more like him. I want to just read the first verse of Mark chapter 1. This morning is really a way of introduction. Mark begins his gospel by saying the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that's really what this entire book is about. It is about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And this is going to be a little bit different of a Sunday morning service. It's going to be uh, a little bit more topical as we introduce the the gospel of John before we start going through it verse by verse to understand the background, to understand the setting, to understand the author before we just dive into it. So I hope you have your Bibles with you this morning because we're going to turn some different places and we're going to learn about the setting. We're going to learn specifically about the author Mark. For those of you that are newer Christians and there's all levels in this church, many who have been saved for many, many years Uh, some who have been saved just recently, I I want to really give you some basic information about the Gospels by way of introduction. When we talk about the Gospels, speaking of books, we're talking about the first four books that make up the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it is the universal testimony of the church from the first century until now that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the only authoritative and inspired gospel accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. They have withstood the scrutiny of scholastic effort for over 2,000 years. Both non-Christians and Christians alike have agreed upon their authorship and their harmony is so incredible as you will see. They all describe the life of Christ all in a little bit different way, but their harmony is incredible mainly because they all have one divine author, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. The Bible tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. 
It's all profitable. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the human penmen, but the divine author was the Holy Spirit of God. And so while we have a divine author, they are all written to different audiences, and therefore they have different styles. Matthew and and Luke are very comprehensive gospels, and they're longer because of that. And they give all the discourses and the teachings of Jesus Christ, where Mark leaves much of the discourses and the teachings out. Somebody has said that Mark is the gospel of action. It is the action gospel. It is more of like a a newspaper edition. And so it is because of that, it's the smallest of the gospels. Perhaps you remember being in a, a race as a kid out on the playground and you would all be getting ready to run and one of the kids would be the spokesman for the race and they would say, on your mark, get set, Go. Well, I've entitled this specific sermon today as introduction, Mark and Reset, Go. And the reason is because Mark is a man who was given another chance. He is a man who, so to speak, the reset button was pushed and giving him another chance. And it is also a a fast-paced gospel as we are going to see. It is a sprint A couple of questions as we introduce this book today. The first one was, how was Mark written? And we've already referenced this. It was written very fast-paced. In fact, the word immediately, Mark mentions over 40 times. It's a gospel emphasizing the actions of Jesus Christ. The word immediately is only mentioned just a few times, only seven times in Matthew and only two times in Luke, but over 40 times in the gospel of Mark. Also, it has only 16 chapters. Twelve of those 16 chapters begin with the word and. Almost like Mark is just taking a quick breath and then he is going again. It is very fast paced. If if Mark's childhood was anything like his writings, he would have been the child that all of us have asked, are we there yet? Are we there yet? He would have probably been diagnosed with ADHD. ADHD. He was always moving, always going somewhere else, always thinking something. It reminded me of the the story that James Dobson tells of the man who was in the store, sent to the grocery store by his wife. And he had a son with him at the time, his high-energy son, his ADHD son, who was a terror, to be honest. Don't raise your hand if you can identify, but most of us have had children like that. And all through the story, he's going through the grocery store, and his son is just grabbing everything that he can get his hands on. And when his dad says no, he's screaming at his dad. And, and someone, a lady that was in the aisle, kind of following behind them, getting her groceries, she heard him saying, John, it's okay. We'll be out of here in no time. Just keep calm, John. Just keep calm, John. And so finally, they, they make it to the checkout counter, and They get up to the checkout counter, and this lady was so impressed with the way this man had handled this son and how calm he was staying. And she said, sir, I just have to tell you that I am so impressed with how calm you were and how calm you stayed with little Johnny and and, and how you just spoke to him so calmly. And he said, man, his name is not John. My name is John. I'm just trying to get myself out of here. So Mark is is this guy who is fast-paced, high action. You're going to see immediately as is in his mind as he writes. And he focuses more and more on the works and the actions of Jesus Christ. So that's how the gospel was written. To whom was it written? I think it's it's important any time that we study a book that we understand the audience to whom it was written. Again, different from the other gospels. Matthew was written for a Jewish Christian audience. Luke was written by Luke to a specific person named Theophilus, laying out the details of the life of Christ in chronological order. John was the last of the Gospels written, written to a a broader audience, the church at large, focusing on the deity of Jesus Christ. But Mark was written to the Romans. It was written to the Romans between 60 and 70 A.D., and This was probably one of the most difficult years in the history of 
the Christian church because a maniac named Nero was ruling the Romans and he was about to begin this massive persecution on Christianity. This persecution was ignited when Nero torched a building in Rome and it got out of hand and it spread rapidly and he took this as a perfect opportunity to place the blame on this strange group of people that had been called the way or Christians. It was the, this persecution that would bring about the death of the Apostle Paul and many other Christians who would taste death in the Colosseum by the mouths of lions and at the hands of gladiators. So Mark is writing this gospel account of the life of Jesus Christ about 30 to 40 years after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. And he is writing to a persecuted people that are in many cases hiding for their lives and certainly people who have a lot of questions. And so he leaves out more of Jesus' words and he emphasizes more on what Jesus did than in any other gospel. And thirdly and primarily this morning, I want us to look at the author. Who was Mark? Who was John Mark? And in order to do that, we need to go to other places in the scripture to put all the, the pieces together. He is not mentioned in the gospels during the earthly ministry of Jesus. We know that Matthew and John were the disciples of Jesus, and so they are talked about throughout the gospels. But Luke and Mark are not mentioned in the gospel accounts. And we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But remember that the gospels, they all end with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then Acts picks up right after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, beginning with 40 days of Jesus spending on the earth, teaching his disciples of the things that are pertaining to the kingdom of God, getting them ready for the commission that he is giving them in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. He is equipping them for world ministry. The church is established in Acts chapter 2. It grows in Jerusalem, then it spreads to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. And persecution is beginning to intensify on Christianity, and especially its key leaders. First of all being Peter, and then Paul as he is converted to Christianity. And the first time that Mark shows up in the Bible is in Acts chapter 12. And that's where I want you to look in your Bibles with us. The first time that we see, the first thing we see about Mark or John Mark is his home and opportunity. You remember in Acts chapter 12, Peter has just been miraculously let out of prison by God and uh, the church has been gathering together praying for his release and an angel releases him from his shackles, opens the prison door and in chapter 12 and verse 12 it says, and when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, notice the mother of John whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Evidently, the house of John Mark was a haven for the apostles and the disciples. They were having a prayer meeting in this home, praying that Peter would be released from prison. And look how the story continues in verse 13. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then say, said they, It is his angel. This is just a little side note, but it's a, a humorous account of this story because it is like so many of us when we pray. The church is gathered together to pray for specifically Peter's release from prison, right? So God miraculously answers their prayer, does what only God can do, releases Peter from prison. And so Peter goes to this door where obviously this house where the church had assembled time and time again and he shows up, the answer to their prayer. And he knocks on the door and when it appears to be Peter and he says it is Peter, they say, oh no, you must be a ghost. Like us so many times, God, would you please do this? God, would you answer our prayer? God, we know that you're all powerful. We know that you can do anything. And we're praying, believing God that you can do this. And God answers our prayer and we go, oh no, something weird must have happened. Something's not right. I mean, God actually answered our prayer. So what we see here about Mark is that his, his home it was a place where the church, the early church, met. Many would think that his 
He came from a wealthy family, having a servant girl and a place that was large enough for everyone together. And look at verse number 25 of chapter 12. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So here we are. John has become a believer in Jesus Christ. He is raised in a home that has been a haven for the disciples. He has heard of the accounts of the life of Jesus Christ from Peter and Paul and his family. And he is given this opportunity of a lifetime to travel with Barnabas and Paul. We see this in verses 2 through 5 of Acts chapter 13. Look at it. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work at whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Caesarea, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews. And they had also John, who was also John Mark, to their minister. So here he is. Not only did he grow up in this home that was connected to housing the early church, but also he is given this incredible opportunity to travel with Paul and Barnabas on their mission trips. The second time, the second thing that we see about Mark is his defection in chapter 13 and verse 13. This is the next passage that gives us information. What happens on their travels? He's on the missionary journey with them. Look at chapter 13, verse 13. Now, when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And here it is again. And John, speaking of John Mark, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, we're not sure what happened here exactly, but the word returned comes from the Greek word that literally means to depart from the faith. Apostasia. We could speculate what happened to cause Mark to go home. We don't know for sure. Barnabas was his cousin, and one thing that we know is that there seems to be a transfer in leadership here where Paul becomes the leader. It could have been jealousy. It could have been fear. It could have been pride. We don't know, but what we do know is this, that John Mark turns back off of the missionary journey, and he goes home. He quits. He throws in the towel. He has, in essence, defected. The third time that we see Mark show up in scriptures in Acts chapter 15. He is received here and he is also refused as we see in Acts chapter 15. Turn there in your Bibles if you would and look at verse number 36. And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again. Remember they're on their missionary journey. Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. Notice verse 37, and Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between Paul and Barnabas that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. So here it is. Barnabas and Paul are ministering. They bring Mark with them to help them with the the jobs, to help them with the ministry. And something happens, and Mark quits, and he goes home. And And over the the matter of time while he's there, evidently he begins to grow in his faith. And now Barnabas wants to give John Mark another chance. And Paul says, no way, Jose, he's not coming with us. And so Barnabas says, well, I'm going to bring him with me. And, And remember, Barnabas is the son of compassion. He is the son of encouragement. And he is determined to restore his cousin to usefulness. And so now Paul and Barnabas part ways. Paul takes Silas, Barnabas takes John Mark. Now go with me to Colossians chapter 4. I told you this is going to be like a Bible study this morning. 
But it's important to put all these pieces together to understand who is writing this gospel that we are talking about. We have looked at his home. We have looked at his opportunity to travel with Paul and Barnabas. We have looked at his defection, his quitting. We have looked now at how Barnabas has received him and Paul has refused him. But here it is in Colossians chapter 4. 18 years has gone by with no mention of Mark. What happens in those 18 years, we are not sure. I think we'll get a little hint of it at the end. But notice what the Apostle Paul says here as he writes to the church. Now again, this is Paul. This is the one, time, the, the one who at one time was his critic. He was the one who said, no, he's not coming with us. But in Colossians chapter 4, he is writing to the church there. And he says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salutes you. And who? Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments. Notice this last phrase. If he come unto you, kick him out, he's no good. No. Kick him out, he's a quitter. No. If he comes to you, what? Receive him. Receive him. God has changed the heart of the Apostle Paul through the years. And now Paul gives his personal recommendation to John Mark to this church. Now look at 2 Timothy chapter 4 for another piece to the puzzle. 2 Timothy chapter 4. You remember this is at the very end of the Apostle Paul's life. He is writing to his son in the faith, Timothy. And here we see that Mark is recognized as a profitable minister, again, by the Apostle Paul, writing to his son in the faith, Timothy, in his final days of life. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, he says this, Only Luke is with me. Take who? Mark. Take Mark and bring him with thee, notice this last phrase, for he is what? Profitable to me for the ministry. Evidently, there were only three people who were faithful to Paul while he was in prison at Rome at the end of his life. And guess who one of those people were? John Mark. Mark, the deserter, had become a faithful companion to the Apostle Paul. And then there's one more piece that I want you to see in 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. In 1 Peter chapter 5, it gives us another very important part of Mark's life. When it says in verse number 13 that the church that is at Babylon elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, Peter writing, notice what he calls him, my what? My son. Peter refers to him as his son. As Timothy was Paul's son in the faith, who he wrote letters to, who he encouraged, who he challenged, who he challenged, so Mark was the son in the faith to the apostle Peter. And this gives us a little bit of clue of what might have happened during that 18-year span. That during that eight, those 18 years, there was a, a, an apostle, a man, who took interest in this guy named Mark, who had defected, who had quit, who had said, I'm not going on the missionary journey. But there was not only Barnabas, but there was this apostle named Peter who said, I will pour into him. I will disciple him. I will train him. And Mark would later become the pastor of the church in Alexandria. And by the way, who better could understand the bitter taste of denying Jesus than the Apostle Peter? Who would have been more compassionate to a young man who had deserted than the one who had done it himself? And so Peter had taken John Mark in and he calls him my son. And we're almost finished. I think we still have music playing through some avenue up here. In closing, I want you to look at Mark's story that we just rehearsed. And I want you to see three closing remarks of maturity, briefly, that we see in, in Mark, in Peter, who was his father in the faith, and in Paul, the one that 
once rejected him, but then proclaimed he is profitable to me. In the lives of Peter and Paul and Mark, we can discover some things that the Lord has been doing for thousands of years that I believe he is still doing today. And, and, and I believe that we can learn from all three of these men and these three specific things that we know about their life from the, the story that we have just read about John Mark. Number one, I think that Peter had learned compassion. That Peter had learned compassion. Remember in his early years, Peter was the kind of man who had his sword ready to fight. He was out in front. He was the one who proudly and boldly proclaimed to Jesus Christ himself, if all of the other disciples desert you and leave you, there is one who will stand with you, Jesus, and it will be me. And you remember that Jesus himself in John 21 had to take Peter down by the river, down by the Sea of Galilee and teach him a very important lesson on humility. He restores him back into fellowship. No doubt in those early years, Peter would have checked John Mark off just like Paul did. But now he has become someone that would take someone who had defected and someone who had quit and someone who had messed up and someone who had fallen and he would show compassion upon them and he would restore them and he would pour into them and he would say in 1 Peter in his epistle, Marcus, you are my son in the faith. He learned compassion. I wonder if that is us today, that in our Christian life, if we have grown in this area of compassion for people. That we are the ones like Barnabas and like Peter who said, hey, somebody needs to find this young man that is, that is discouraged, that is downhearted, that has messed up, that has stepped into sin, that has quit on God, that is away from God, and hey, we are going to invest in his life. We're going to show him compassion. We're going to show him patience, just as Jesus showed us patience. Just as Jesus showed us compassion. Are we patient with people? Are we long-suffering? What you're going to see as we study the gospel of Mark is that Jesus the one who taught Peter to be patient exemplified it like no one else. When he saw the multitudes, the Bible says he was fill filled with what? Compassion. Paul had learned, Peter had learned compassion. Secondly, I think that Paul had learned the importance of forgiveness. Like so many of us would have Paul checked John Mark off as a quitter. In fact, in Paul's mind, there's, there's no room for soft soldiers in the army of God. We are leading the way. There's no time for this. He was quick to move on without him. He was resistant to restoring him. He's not let his defection go. He is perhaps even bitter, a little bitter at John Mark little bitter at the way he left them. Yet in his later years, we find, as we read today, we find that Paul has forgiven John Mark and even recommends him and announces his own need for him in the end of his life, that he is profitable to me as an apostle. God has done a great work in his heart, in his life. I can't help but think of people who may have hurt us People who may have not done it like we thought it should be done. And hey, we've got a mission to accomplish and we're on, we're on task with God. And some people didn't do it just like we thought they should. And, and so because of that, there's been a grudge in our heart. There's been bitterness in our heart. There's been angst in our heart. But maybe in our, in our growth, in our maturity as Christians, we can learn from the Apostle Paul to say, hey, we need to learn to forgive. We need to learn to give people another chance. We need to, to, to learn to show compassion upon them. Peter learned compassion. Paul had learned forgiveness. But thirdly, I want you to see from Mark something that we see very obvious that he had learned in his life was perseverance. 
At the first sign of struggle or disagreement, whatever it was, John Mark quit. He threw in the towel. Yet by the grace of God and by the patience of God, we find God building a mark of maturity in Mark that we all need. And that is perseverance. It is endurance. Listen, church, it is faithfulness to God in the good times and in the bad times. When everything's going like we think it should and when nothing is going like we think it should. We need to be people with settled hearts and surrendered wills. Not to our own will, but to the will of God. And I remind all of us this morning that this is not any human being's church. This is God's church. It's His church. And everybody doesn't have to do things the way you or I think it should be done or agree with us every T cross the way we think it should and I dotted the way that it should. What we learned from these spiritual leaders of the early church, Paul and Peter and Mark, is that we need to be people of compassion. We need to be people of forgiveness. We need to be people of perseverance and who aren't easily offended, who aren't easily quit when the first thing goes wrong. Dig in and settle in and say, this is where God has us. This is where we are going to serve the Lord. This is where we are going to be faithful. In closing, I want to wrap up the life of John Mark with this simple statement. It's a reminder that we also saw in the study of Jonah. But when you think of John Mark, you think of this. God gives second chances. Would you say that with me again this morning? God You know, if you're here today and you never began a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, I have good news for you. God's brought you here this morning to hear how you can have eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. He's given you another chance today. Now, I don't know what will happen to you when you leave here, but I know this morning that God has brought you here. And if you have never began a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, not by your works, not by your religion, but by simple faith in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, then you can be saved today. God's given you another chance today. He's the God of second chances. Perhaps you're here today and... And you're saved, but you're away from the Lord. Something had happened in your life that had caused you to to quit, to defect on past commitments, to step back in your Christian life instead of going forward. I want to encourage you this morning that God has you here today to hear a message about a man who wrote one of the Gospels of the Lord Jesus Christ, who at one time was a quitter, a defector, someone who had turned back, but God restored him and used him in an incredible way. God is a God of second chances. And maybe you, well certainly, if you've ever been saved, you have not lost your relationship with God, but maybe you're out of fellowship with God. There's no closeness there. There's no real connection there because of something in your life. I want to encourage you today that God is a God of second chances. The fact is that we all fail. The fact is is that we all do things that we regret. The fact is that we all say things that we deplore that we said we hurt people that we love we're humans we're not alone in this in fact the apostle Paul was no stranger to failure and he writes in Romans chapter 7 for that which I do I allow not for what I would that do I not but what I hate that do I He goes on to say that the good things that I want to do in my spirit, I don't do. But the evil which I don't want to do, those are the things that I find myself doing. How many of you would say, like the Apostle Paul, I've been there. I've been there. I don't want to do it. I find myself doing it. If you have, listen as he shows us the way out of despair Romans chapter 7, verse 24, O wretched man that I am. By the way, that would be a good place for us to start. Setting our halos aside, stopping comparing ourselves to everybody else with ourselves in a higher view and see ourselves as the Apostle Paul saw himself, O wretched man that I am. 
Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The struggle that's going on. When am I going to be delivered from it? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that with the mind I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh the law of sin. Notice how he begins chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. You are forgiven. He wants restored fellowship with you. He wants to use you again. If you need a second chance, you've come to the right place. Not because of our church, but because of the Jesus we preach about. He is a God of second chances. In fact, second chances are his specialty. And if you've never been saved... He's given you another chance today to be saved. One day the Bible tells us, as we'll see again tonight in Revelation, that all of us will stand before God. We'll all stand before God and you won't be able to pull up a family member. You won't be able to say, this is the reason I'm in. You won't be able to pull up your list of good deeds and say, this is the reason that I'm in. The only way that you will enter eternal life with God is if you have said that the righteousness of Jesus is applied to my account because I have put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. It's the only only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He is the only way. If you're here today and you've been saved, then I want to encourage you, if you're away from the Lord, to come back to him today. Maybe Satan has filled your mind with so many lies that you can't be used again because of what you've done. I want to remind you this morning that God is a God of forgiveness and restoration. He desires to use you. He desires to forgive you. He has forgiven you. He desires for you to see yourself how he sees you. And for you to be able to be used again by God. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Matt's going to come. Brian's going to come. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking this this morning except for myself. And I promise not to embarrass you or to to call you out. But I do want to pray for you. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that would just say, Josh, I'll be honest with you. I can't go back in my heart and my mind to a place and a time where I put my faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. I can't remember a time when I've turned from my sin and from even my good works to put my faith in Christ alone and to accept his gift of salvation. And the truth is that if I were to leave here today and my life were to end, I don't know where I would spend eternity. But I want to know God's dealing with my heart this morning. Would you just slip your hand up? I won't embarrass you, but I want to pray for you. Anyone this morning? See that hand? Anyone else? See that hand? I'm not sure. I can't really go back to a a time and place. But I want to know if this last 10 days has taught us anything. It's reminded us of the brevity of life. not always going to have another chance but today you do and maybe you would say I'm, I know I'm saved but I'll be honest I'm not where I need to be I have listened to the lies of Satan the enemy, my flesh I have been discouraged I've not been in a place of usefulness God spoke into my heart today would you just raise your hand let me see your hand many, many hands many hands we sing in just a moment this is a time for you to come. If you don't know of your eternal destiny, I wish you would come and let someone take the Bible and show you. John said this, that we may know that we have eternal life. You can know that today. God spoke into your heart, Christian. I hope that you'll come and find a place. Let's stand together as Brian leads us in this invitation. If you know it, sing it along with him. If God's spoken to your heart, come to this altar this morning. Change my heart, oh God. I'll meet you down here. I'll meet you down here. Make it ever true. Or you can pray on your own. You just need to pray.
pray like Change this. my heart, oh God. May I be like you. You are the potter. I am the clay. Hold me and me. this gospel that we're going to study over the next few months. And Lord, I thank you for people who invested in it. I thank you for Peter. I thank you for Paul and the work that you did in their life through John Mark. How you brought them to maturity. How you brought them to a place of patience and compassion and forgiveness. Lord, build those things in us, we pray. Lord, I pray that You would help us to have, as John Mark learned, an endurance, a perseverance, a faithfulness to you, that we would not be swayed, that we would not quit, that we would not allow discouragement to alter us from your will for our life. And Lord, I pray that you will build these things in us. We pray, God, that you will work in the hearts of those that raise their hand here today, perhaps those that are watching online that do not know you as Savior, we pray, God, that you would help them before they leave today or they're in their home to pick up the phone, to call, to reach out to us and let us share with them how they can know that they have eternal life. Lord, we thank you. We look forward to this study, most of all because it is of you and you leave us a pattern pray that we'll fall more in love with you through this study. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. We're going to watch just a short announcement video, possibly. And then um, Brother Mark is going to come with just a quick announcement. Can you interpret just the... Uh, Sweets and Treats. Sweets and Treats is coming up on August the 31st. If you want to help be a part of that, that's our next big outreach. And I encourage you to help us with that. You can also find more information about that in the bulletin, how you can help us pack bags for that. Also, next Sunday evening, we will not have a regular service here. We're going to be having our Fall Family Fellowship Connection Night out at Mission Point. I dish or a dessert to share. On November the 6th, we have the special opportunity to have Dr. Tim Lee, who will be preaching for our Veterans Sunday service. This is an excellent opportunity. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Faith Baptist Tabernacle. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us today. Here are a few things we have coming up in Faith Life. Thank you for bringing in candy for our Sweets and Treats outreach taking place on October 31st. There's still time to bring more candy in if you haven't been able to yet. On October 28th, we will assemble goodie bags and attach tracks to them. If you can help, please be in the ladies' classroom this Friday at 9 a.m. Our Fall Family Fellowship Connection Night will take place next Sunday, October 30th from 4 to 6 p.m. We will have a meal, fellowship, and worship together out at Mission Point. Please bring a side dish or a dessert to share. On November the 6th, we have the special opportunity to have Dr. Tim Lee who will be preaching for our Veterans Sunday service. This is an excellent opportunity for us not only to honor our veterans, but also to reach them and their families with the gospel. Following the service that morning, we will provide lunch for all veterans and their families who are in attendance. Make plans to bring someone with you for this special day. 
teams. Get ready for Reverb on November 18th and 19th. This insanely fun all-nighter is one of my favorite events of the entire year. You won't want to miss it. Remember that the most important part of this event is providing an opportunity for your generation to hear the gospel. Start inviting your friends now. The cost is $30, but that price can be reduced by 50% for all your friends who need to be reached with the gospel. For all of our visitors, we'd like to say a special thank you for choosing to worship with us today. If you look on the back of the seat in front of you, you'll see a connection card. Once you've filled it out and either dropped it in the offering plate or handed it to a member of our hospitality team at the Welcome Center, we'll be able to keep you more up to date with all the events going on here at Faith. We're looking forward to getting to know you better. Our midweek refresher on Wednesdays is a great opportunity for everyone in your family to study the Bible as well as make valuable connections. Gospel projects for kids, faith students, the midweek meetup, and an adult Bible study, there's something for everyone. Make plans to join us on campus this Wednesday at 6.30. Tonight, our evening worship service will begin at 6 p.m. We'd love to have you join us again as we continue worshiping our Savior and learning more about Him. Thanks again for joining us today. This has been Faith Life. Um, as leader of the First Impressions group, I'd like to invite each of you personally. I, I've met each of you, I know, but invite each of you personally to come next Sunday night at Mission Point. Don't forget, it's at Mission Point. It's an intentional effort to try and be able to connect people better than we do. Uh, when we just shake hands today, we can't talk very much, but uh, please try and come next Sunday night. And we kind of hijacked that. We're going to also do, since October is Pastor Appreciation Month, we're going to have a, an appreciation ceremony for Pastor Josh, Pastor Matt, and Pastor Austin. A little different this year, but, uh, but if you can come, we would appreciate it. And I know the pastors would appreciate seeing you there. If you are unable to attend or are able to attend, uh, I'm sure they'd like to have a card that uh, anything you have to say or to express to them, they would appreciate it. And monetary gifts are fine. So uh, <clears throat> look forward to seeing you guys next week. And if you have no reason to show appreciation, there's food there. So just come and enjoy the food. And we'll have a good time of fellowship together and connecting with one another. I do hope you'll be back this evening. We <clears throat> are doing a study which has been interrupted with Missions Month and other things, great things. But we have, it's been a while since we've been in Revelation. And we are going to be back there tonight finishing a sermon that we began, um, I guess, about seven weeks ago on hell, man's final judgment, as described to us in Revelation chapter 20. And I would encourage you to come back. Maybe you've never heard a message on hell. It's not a topic that is preached a lot about, but it is in the Bible a lot. And it is something that we need to preach about. And I hope that you will come tonight, be a part of that, and invite people to come and be with you. It will be a compassionate but biblical message on the reality of hell. And so I hope that you'll come back tonight for that. Let's stand together for uh, our dismissal. And all of those that are guests, we're so glad to have you today. Just met a family that has just moved here from New Jersey. So good to have you guys and folks who are just here visiting for the weekend and others. But uh, find some folks here that are local that I got to meet as well. Get around and, and meet people that you don't know. Introduce yourself to them as we leave. Father, again, we thank you and praise you for all that you have done in our hearts and lives today, and we pray that you'll bring, you will keep us safe and bring us back again together this evening. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You're dismissed.